On June 3, 2016, an oil train carrying 96 cars of volatile Bakken crude derailed in the small town of Mosier, Oregon. 16 of the cars derailed and four of these caught fire. Investigations indicate the incident was caused by one or more broken bolts. These hold the tracks together. Luckily, not one of the 438 people who live in Mosier were hurt. Reports say the whole town was evacuated until basic needs were addressed. They were unable to use their wastewater system for about a week, meaning no used water could go down any drain. Residents were also ordered to boil water before consuming it. The fire was too much for the available first response team. According to some reports, a crew of six full-time volunteers worked with the Mosier Fire Chief Jim Appleton and a wildfire crew for over 13 hours to contain the fire. Other media reports state that 15 fire departments were on site to help control what could have been a much bigger disaster. Fire Chief Appleton said in an article on the Oregon Public Broadcasting website, I think it's insane. I've been very hesitant to take up a side until now, but with this incident, and with all due respect to the wonderful people that I've met at Union Pacific, shareholder value doesn't outweigh the lives and happiness of our community. Much of the media attention about emergency preparedness in regards to the transport of volatile Bakken crude has been on stockpiling the critical equipment needed to fight this type of fire, such as fire suppressing foam. This approach is supported by the Emergency Responders Handbook used by responders all over the nation. According to Fire Chief Appleton, the foam was not able to do the job of suppressing the fire for the first 10 hours after the spill. It could not be directly applied to the ignited rail car. Appleton said, the rationale that was explained to me by the Union Pacific Fire personnel is that the metal is too hot and the foam will land on that white hot metal and evaporate without any suppression effect, he said. That was kind of an eye-opener for me. Much of that first 10 hours was spent on cooling the cars next to the ignited car, using water from the Columbia River. The responders applied about 1,500 gallons of water per minute to the white hot rail cars. Fire Chief Appleton went on to say, if the same derailment had happened just 24 hours earlier, there would have been 35 mile an hour gusts blowing the length of the train. The fire very easily could have spread to summer all of the 96 cars behind because they were in the line of the prevailing wind. First responders were not able to get to the site of the accident quickly due to a massive snarl of traffic on Interstate 84. 42,000 gallons of crude oil were released during the incident on June 3rd, about as much as one and a half oil cars. About 10,000 gallons were recovered from the town's wastewater systems. The rest of the oil went up in flame, and a highly visible column of inky black smoke that rolled up the plateau, potentially leaving residue to settle on the food being grown for this year's crops, marking the earth and marking the waterways, contaminating this place for years to come. According to an article in the Tacoma News Tribune, in 2014, 988 oil-laden trains traveled through Washington. If proposed facilities are fully built out and the export continues, 7,124 such trains could move through the state annually by 2020. The federal government regulates oil by rail between states, leaving cities and towns with no power over the movement of this dangerous cargo. However, cities can block projects through the use of zoning and permit restrictions. Hopefully in Washington approved a ban on the storage of bulk crude oil in proposed facilities last year. The city of Vancouver is considering similar action. If the new proposed oil storage terminal in Vancouver is approved, four mile and a half long oil trains, 120 cars each, would be moving through the Columbia River Gorge daily. From an article in the Oregonian and Oregon Live, when oil trains began hauling mile long loads of crude a few years ago, they used an outdated rail car called the DOT 111. The car punctured easily and tore open in derailments. Now oil increasingly moves in a second generation car called the CPC 1232. It's stronger with a reinforced steel shield on each end. All the cars in the Mosher derailment were CPC 1232s. But as that fiery wreck and several others have made clear, 
oil moving in those tank cars is still dangerous. Under federal rules issued last year, DOT 111s and CPC 1232s are due to be phased out or retrofitted in favor of a newer car called the DOT 117. That process will target the most unsafe cars first, but that will take years. Tank cars like those in the Mosier derailment can still ply the rails until May 1, 2025. Representatives from the rail line told CBS News that the track stretches that we've built through the Columbia River Gorge are the safest track structures in the industry and in the United States of America. An article in Railway Age talks about the cost of updating the oil cars that haul Bach and crude, primarily as well as other hazardous cargo. The cost of the fleet renewal is estimated by the regulators to be about $1.7 billion. Total cost for the entire regulatory package, including train routing and speed restrictions, is projected to be $2.5 billion. The regulations remove the burden of reporting every oil train movement to state emergency response agencies. Instead, railroads must promptly respond to requests for information initiated by local emergency responders. This should address railroad complaints that business and security concerns were being compromised by state freedom and information laws. An article in the Seattle Times states, the Columbia River Gorge offers a nightmare scenario for derailment disaster, referring to the busy rail lines placed tightly between the wall of a rock canyon and the major highway in the area. Many communities live along the Columbia River, a major waterway for endangered salmon and steelhead. Communities along the gorge, including tribes with treaty rights to fish, are being subjected to unreasonable danger, said Sarah Thompson, spokeswoman for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. In Mosher, the tracks pass within about 300 feet from a kindergarten through eighth grade school. The town itself sits just 70 miles east of Portland, Oregon. In Washington State, residents and businesses are expected to be prepared to take care of themselves for up to three days in the event of an emergency. On June 8th, the Washington State Council of Firefighters wrote a letter to Governor Jay Inslee citing the fire in Mosher as a stark reminder of the harm the transport of Bakken crude poses to communities. The letter goes on to talk about the upcoming fire season and notes that resources will be stretched thin and a derailment and fire in dry wildfire fuels with high winds could easily overwhelm available personnel and equipment in many parts of our state and grow into a conflagration of immense proportions. The letter asked Governor Inslee to use his authority to reject plans for oil terminals now under review, like the ones in Vancouver and Copeland. Industry representatives in many of the articles cited for this work talk about the demand for oil as though it was non-negotiable. Changes to our patterns of fossil fuel consumption are possible, though they are not going to change if the industry is allowed to expand. The oil train fire in Mosher, Oregon should be an incentive to change to seek alternatives to fossil fuel use. We know that the practice of transporting volatile Bakken crude is a danger to people near the tracks in densely populated areas as well as rural areas. We know that the amount of cargo being moved currently is more than first response teams can handle. Preventing the industry expansion is the best way to prevent this sizable threat to the health of people living in proximity to rail lines shipping such hazardous cargo, 